Because this is kind of, this is the test. Right. You know, this is where we're going to find out, you know, whether or not this deck is capable of competing against the big boys. And we know the deck's good. The deck had the highest game win percentage in the entire tournament. But we don't know if the deck can beat Callblade. And here we are, Brian in the zone. I'm really excited to see how this one plays out. Okay, so Josh Silvestri running two Baneslayer Angels and two Tumble Magnets and a Mortar, a mortar pod. pod. Wow, what does he do to get rid of all of the other stuff to make this happen? Well, he only has six counter spells, uh, two Spell Pierce and four Mana Leak, and uh, he only has two Day of Judgments where most people have more. Uh, he's also, I believe, he's playing 26 lands um, as, as opposed to 27 which is in a lot of decks. Uh, now this deck, besides that, looks pretty basic. The, uh, the Baneslayer Angels are really good here, but uh, Josh's deck, the one thing that it doesn't do as well as other blue-white Callblade decks is it can't tech edge aggressively. He has uh, five, five drops as opposed to the normal count of three. That's the big change I see here. Um, the two Total Magnets seem incredible to me. Uh, they're especially good in the Callblade Mirrors. But, uh, you know, the one thing that impresses me about Brian's deck is that he is 100% capable of beating Swords. His Tome Magnets are very good there. Now, what we're going to want to see from Brian, if we want Brian to win, is we're going to want to see some... an early Crusader, followed by Counter Magic or Jaces. Uh, what Josh is going to want to see is... Josh is, wanna, is going to want a... He can use Mortar Pod to deal with those Crusaders, and just in general, Josh just wants to curve out the normal way a Quad Blade deck does. Um, I mean, one of the things I like about looking at Josh's list is that he has the Tumble Magnets that we've both been gushing about, and you definitely have been really enthusiastic, and I'm enthusiastic basically partly because of your own enthusiasm. But then the other part of it is that he has those Bane Slayers that I think are really good for the mirror. Yeah, I mean, First Strike is just incredible in the mirror. That's one of the reasons why Stoneforge Mystic was, uh, or not, um, rather, Student of Warfare was played for the mirror before uh, Callblade started to take on Third Color. Now, uh, we're getting into the game here. Uh, Brian leads off and uh, passes the turn to Josh. Josh has a uh, preordain of his own here. Now, these players have both have an, had an opportunity to look at each other's deck list at this point. So, the early preordains, which I usually find in a... Oftentimes, I like to hold off until turn two or turn three, so I can sculpt based on what my opponent is. When you already know what your opponent is, casting it on turn one is much more acceptable. Yeah, that's definitely true. This deck repeat is going to uh, poke in some early infect counters, unless uh, Josh plays... One of uh, one of the eight two drops in his deck here, and he doesn't. Uh, Brian may have tr tried to use Necropete as an opportunity to get his opponent to tap some mana so that he could resolve Rexing Crusader. Right, right. Now in this situation, though, I think Brian's just happy to play land and pass the turn back. I mean, right now. Just working away at somebody with poison for this deck, he doesn't need to actually do anything particularly aggressive when he can effectively threaten with a mana leak for any major play for Josh. Yep. You know? And, uh, you know, that extra preordain, he's just sculpting his hand, and he's going to sit here and let that Necropede do some work. By the time the Necropede actually gets dealt with, it might have like four poison on Josh. And the other thing is that, you know, Brian's deck has access to Proliferate, and uh, it, it would not be unusual for this game to get very bogged down in Salt, yeah. and uh, a Contagion class can really just steal those games away. And I know that Brian was saying earlier that um, in the way that this matchup ends up playing out is that a Contagion class often ends up being the real end of the game. Yeah, and that makes sense. All right, Josh is going to pass. He's going to leave up the Mental League. Brian gets in for a second poison counter. Reaches long for it.
Yet another preordain. I believe that's his <laughs> third preordain. He practically has a uh, very uh, incredible sculpture in front of him. <coughs> yeah, and I mean, at this point, you can count on Brian's hand being uh, pretty tight. Yeah. Josh, on the other hand, I mean, Josh's hand, uh, you know, we don't really know what's in Josh's hand, but cards like Gideon can be very good against Brian, and Brian really has to leave open counter magic so he can fight those types of things. And I mean, with only four mana leaks and a deprive, um, it's tough to do. yeah. Josh is going to uh, attempt to play uh, Stoneforge Mystic. And I believe he's probably going to find a Mortar Pod. And he does indeed find the Mortar Pod. Mortar Pod is just such an interesting card, you know. Yeah, I, I would incredible. not have expected seeing it in the top eight, but it, once it's here, you know, like, seeing it play out in the earlier portions of the, ta of the day seems pretty good. Yeah, every time we saw it, it was uh, very, very impressive. And we have... Uh, uh, Josh just passed again. Josh uh, says, well, I'm, I'm just going to leave open my counter magic. Yeah. And I can just drop this mortar pot into play with my Stoneforge Mystic. It's not a big deal. Okay, Inquisition. And that's pretty good here. Having that type of information is pretty powerful. Well, we know that there's at least one target that is good enough that Josh tutored for it. Yeah. Mana leak with three mana open from Kibler, prompting the attempt for, hey, do you want to tap out and let me have the opportunity for Jace? Is that what you want to do? And maybe Brian does. I guess so. See what you got. Something off screen. And pre it's a tumble magnet, a sword, a mortar pod, and a preordain. Yeah, apparently the cards we cannot see that are above the quarterfinals mark are land. Okay. Now, so uh, what is he going to take here? I mean, I mean, it's pretty tough. Like, it's really tough. I don't, yeah, he's thinking. Look at that. Oh, I'll take that. Sword? Yeah, yeah. sword. And, you know, that's got to be the card to take. I don't have a problem with that card going away. Now, he knows, because he's seen his opponent's deck list, that there's another sword yet in the library. Yeah. That doesn't... It's not in his opponent's hand, it's just so strong. Yes. It's so tough to beat a sword. We're gonna have to see what uh happens here, so Brian puts on Ink Moth Nexus, which is surprisingly good here. Normally it's not very good in this matchup. Squadron Hawk uh kinda puts the uh puts the brakes on that. But as we saw earlier, when we saw his hand, Josh doesn't have a squadron hawk in hand. It's true. Oh my God! <laughs> oh, oh, that was just devastating. And that's pretty brutal for Brian. Nice uh, off the top. Yeah, I mean, it happens. That's magic. It could have been a Gideon. Could have yeah. been a Jace. Lots of stuff it could have been. <laughs> I think you'd rather it be a squadron hawk than a Gideon or a Jace. <laughs> yeah, this is true. This is true. Although, maybe not. Okay, and down comes Mortar Pod. Yeah, and Mortar Pod alongside those Squadron Hawks can really do some work. I'm actually surprised we haven't seen that in more lists now that I'm thinking about it. 
I mean, like that first mortar pot on the table means that the first um, squadron hawk of your opponent can't be um, can't be equipped. The first one, and then your own squadron hawks means that subsequent ones can't be. And here we go, preordaining, looking for something tasty. And uh, thinking, Ooh. does that have regenerate? Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Skitherex is this card. Yeah. So like, oh, man, you know, the first nice time card. I played against Skitherex, I just crushed my opponent. I'm like, oh, no big deal. We go to the second game, he casts Skitherex. I did not realize it had regenerate because it already felt good enough. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so he's like checking that card. What does that card do? Oh, it has regenerate. Yeah, I mean, it, it's scary how good that card can yeah. be. Other than, uh... See, uh... It doesn't do well against a Baneslayer Angel, though. It's still a dragon. Well, you know, Baneslayer Angel, um, normally for black, wouldn't be that, um, Ooh, rough. Also not very good against Tumble Magnet. Oh, Magnes, yeah. And another Hawk. Go. Go. Interested to see, uh... How Brian can find a way out of this. I mean, we're a long way from Josh actually being in a um, oh, yeah. I mean, commanding position. I mean, that Skitherex... Josh only has two points power on the table. That Skitherex is only going to be held down for us a very short while. Until Josh gets something else that's a little bit more fierce out there, that Skitherex is still a problem, particularly now that Brian, if he wants to, can stay untapped so that a Day of Judgment won't take care of it. Yeah, I mean... The big issue, though, is Co-op League closes very quickly. Well, I mean, and it, Josh it, it just, closes uh, in a vacuum, but what does Josh have? He doesn't have anything to do the closing yet. Well, he just preordained last turn. Yeah. So and that got him to the Tumble Magnet. Didn't, oh, no, didn't, it got him to something. Yeah, you're yeah, right. I yeah, I thought he had the Tumble Magnet. And there's a Tumble Magnet of Kibblers. No. Wow, that Tumble Magnet means he can shut off... Um, yeah. Shut off Josh's Tumble Magnet, but uh, it may actually be advantageous for him to... Uh, Hold really it back for, a, for yeah. a Feast of Famine. Feast or Famine. Yeah. Or a Baneslayer Angel. I think I see a Contagion Clasp in uh, Kibler's hand. That would be very good right now. Representing Mana Leak by keeping that mana up. And yeah, that makes it a lot harder for Josh to do something like cast a Mainslayer Angel or cast a Gideon. Right. I mean, Brian could have a lot of stuff here. Brian could have a Deprive. Yep. You know, you could have a Leak. I mean, again, Brian hasn't have... really had a favorable opportunity to cast either of those spells, so. Yep. I'm Josh. I'm thinking he definitely has one of those. Josh comes in for two. Just, just gonna play some more hawks. It looks like. Ooh, preordain. Looking for some more, uh, some more scary things. And uh, I believe he found a sword. And uh, well, Tumble Magnet will be good against. Oop, puts both on the bottom and he draws. Yep. Let's see what he found. I mean, Josh is basically, I think, looking for a Planeswalker here. Yeah, yeah Planeswalker would uh, what did do he just very cast? well. Stoneforge Mystic. That will oh, also that's do pretty very good. well. I mean, I think Josh at that point was looking for any card in his deck. <laughs> I'm less impressed by a Stoneforge Mystic in this game state than I would be by a Planeswalker. Well, I mean, the thing is, he has a second copy of Sword of Feast and Famine, so even though his opponent has a Tumble Magnet, um, it just... It makes things hard. Like your your tunnel magnet really is working on the sword. Well, here's the thing, right? Is that uh, if I saw that correctly, and Brian Kibler has a contagion clasp in his hand, his opponent just tapped down in order to get to this game state, and a contagion clasp can mean that that tumble magnet never goes away, That's that true. it lasts forever. Wow. Wow. Taps the tumble. Yep. 
class of creature. Class player squadron hawk. Yep. Poison you to six. What did Kibler say about six poison? Yeah. <laughs> we said that if his opponent's at six poison, I pass the turn that they're dead. <laughs> they're actually dead. Go. And that tumble magnet is still up to do some work. And I mean, it's <laughs> so rough. <laughs> and four turns, the clasp is going to kill Josh. Not yet. I should say five turns because he can't activate the clasp yet. So if the game just stays still, yeah. that clasp is going to kill him. It's interesting how clasp can be like an aggressive card. <laughs> And Gideon? Yeah. Gideon Ooh, is fine. Ooh, and this is certainly going to draw a Deprive. Oh, though. Deprive. And the crazy thing, he's got those two Hawks, but because even with Tumble Magnet Hawk Hawk, he can't effectively attack with one of the Hawks. <laughs> At the end of the turn, tap the tumble magnet. <laughs> Plays a land. Oh, and man. tumble away, my friend. Tumble away. <laughs> Attack. He, he points to, uh, oh, wow. Into the royal. Yep, and that'll there do it. There we go. Zing, zing. No Skinner Rex the Blight Dragon. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. Brian sticks good. I that, like it. Like, that looked that looked really bad for him. Oh, I like the I deck a lot. I wasn't really sure how he was going to, you know, find a way out of that situation. And uh, you know, he just really engineered the board state. Like the, there was a tumble magnet play. There were, you know, just tons of things. So right now we're going to do the giveaway for three months of premium. Uh, the hashtag is at. SCG Premium. Uh, it's on the screen for you guys now, and uh, the question I'm going to ask is, there is a three-mana artifact that has uh, kind of uh, been the breakout card this weekend. Uh, both of these players have in their deck, and uh, I'd like to know what that card is. Interesting. Three-mana artifact, huh? Yeah. I don't... That's big. <laughs> I think he's correct. I think he's correct. Um, Rashad says from the side that there are a couple of three mana artifacts that uh, there's only one three mana artifact in Kibler's deck. Yeah, are in. This is true. There's only one three mana artifact in uh, in Kibler's deck. I'd like to know the name of a three mana artifact that Brian Kibler is playing. That is the, in my opinion, the breakout card this weekend. It is. Uh, the uh, the only three mana artifact in Brian Kibler's deck. And, uh, Josh Silvestri is also been playing talking it. Talking about it all day, so it's also in Josh Silvestri's deck. Pretty much. Yeah, my previous version, I was like, man, I always lose the Gideon. And I'm like, okay, I'll just I'll lose the Gideon. Okay. From the sideboard, um, looking at Josh Silvestri's sideboard, he has one Mystifying Maze in the sideboard, which I think is actually going to be very effective. Um, and. Three oust, which uh, might be able to be effective as a um, way to stall the Skithrix from being so potent. Baneslayer Angel is expensive, but maybe worth thinking about. But what are the cards he might not want in this matchup? What do you think? Um, is Mortar Pot all that exciting in this matchup? Uh, I don't think so. I think. Uh, you know, it, it may be his way to beat Crusader, though. I, the right? Part is, like, and have, like, that like, has value in itself. Um, so what does he cut? Because I mean, I like basically nearly every other card in here. I mean, Bane Slayer has value by being able to fight a dragon, but because of the tumble magnets, Bane Slayer might be just too expensive of a commitment to try to uh, to try to use. Yeah, I mean, if I uh, if I were Josh here. I would probably be taking out a 
one Bane Slayer Angel and bringing in one Mystifying Maze. <laughs> Mystifying Maze seems really great. Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I don't mind seeing... Um, I mean, maybe Spreading Seas is useful just to make the Crusader come on the table a little bit later. Uh, it's hard, though. I mean, yeah. so many of his lands are duels. I mean, uh, Kibler has... He only has four islands. So there really are 18 to... black sources. Yeah. <laughs> And I mean, he has preordains and things like that. So, like when you're when you're slowing down the Crusader by a turn, you're like it's giving him more turns where he's leaving him in counter magic. Yeah, this is true. This is true. What about Oust as an answer to Scytherix? Um, I mean, I I really don't like siding an Oust against Phyrexian Crusader. Yeah, it might just be the one mystifying maze. Sometimes I can't read my own hand. I wouldn't be upset. I mean, I would like to do more than that, but I mean, Mystifying Maze seems like a very powerful possible um, card from the board. Meanwhile, yeah. on the other side, we've got um, we've got another a lot. Jace. Jace Bellerin. Looks like they're just about to start. Uh, two duress, and then the question of whether or not you want to have uh, creature kill spells. I know that Kibler says that that's not the way to go, but maybe into the Royal, which is one of the cards that we talked about earlier as a means to fight against opposing planeswalkers. Yeah, it's also a good way to fight swords. Yeah. Well, like, uh, Gideon and other Planeswalkers are the real issue. If you have them expecting a Gideon's going to save them, and then you just bounce it, ouch. Okay, the classic turn two Stoneforge Mystic gets sort of Feast and Famine. Yeah, and uh, Brian's going to preordain. He's going to look for a Duress or an Inquisition of Kozlek, because he's going to want to take that sword away from Josh. Um... Not quite clear if he's found one yet. I wonder if Josh Silvestri researched out the mortar pod in game one because he already had a sword of feast and famine in hand oh. and he wanted to diversify. Yep. There we go. There's the the discard spell. <laughs> Duress. Takes sword. We also see Jace the Mind Sculptor. We see a preordain. Two preordains. Uh, a Gideon and Spell Pierce. Spell Pierce. So he's got so a pair of pair of planeswalkers, pair of preordains, and a spell pierce. That's a pretty good spot to be in, but you know, he's going to have to get issue. some lands. Yeah, he's going to have to use gonna help. It'll help, but he's going to have to make them go for lands. He can't yeah. choose the good spell. It's going to be land sculpting sure time. No no. And he gets to see four cards right now. <laughs> <laughs> right off the top. Or he, uh, <laughs> yeah. or he doesn't even need to. Might as well cast the preordain uh, this time. And looks like a, what, is that a tumble magnet, maybe? I think... And, uh, you know, he may be uh, kicking himself a little bit here that he played that land because maybe he would have wanted to, uh, you know, play that Celestial Colony that he just drew. Now he uh, might not be able to play the Jace next turn. Well, if that's a... I think that that land he put into play was a Seagram Coast, so he wouldn't have been able to do it either way. Oh, that's true. Second period, uh, yeah, looking for, for, looking for right. a, a Jace uh, the other land. The <laughs> Puts them both on top. Ooh. That's that's interesting that uh, you know, just chose to pass the turn and uh, let Brian potentially resolve a Jace. There he is. Ouch. That even if you kill that Jace. Yeah, and I mean he can't so really kill the next turn. Well, with, a, with his really own Jace, hard. if he has the land for it. Yeah. That's just terrible. Yeah, it's really rough. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Not a man that is happy. I mean, Brian's deck is showing us that it's it's definitely capable of competing. Absolutely. And like we've been talking about, maybe that third Jace Bellerin belongs main. I'm guessing this Jace is going plus two <laughs> next turn. And two mana gets the second Stoneforge Mystic. She's probably going to find the other sword. Uh, yep. Where are you? One of you left in my deck. There it is. Yeah, it's interesting. If he had access to, uh, to an untapped land there, he could have Stoneforge Mystic for the motor pod and then killed the Jace, if he still has the motor pod in his deck. Now, uh, he has the Spell Pierce up. So, uh, could potentially, you know, do some work. But uh, at this point, I think Brian just wants to resolve a guy. 
Inquisition of Kozilek. What do you got? <laughs> he puts preemptively his uh, sort of feast and famine in the yard. Kibler does not disagree. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll agree with you. <laughs> And what does the Jace want to do? Jace is uh, probably going to tick out. It seems uh, ill-advised to let his, let your opponent uh, cast his Jace. Now, uh, I think it's interesting. It's uh and they both draw, making Jace a four. And Josh isn't really... Actually, pardon me, making Jace a three. My bad. As far behind as it seems, though. Preordain? Well, it really depends on what Brian draws, though. If Brian, for example, plays a Necropede, then Josh is almost out of the game, which is <laughs> funny. Necropede is the key card right now. Well, I mean, Josh, you know, is still going to potentially cast... A uh, Gideon Jura next turn. And Gideon Jura is very good against Brian's deck. Absolutely. And Brian does have Mana Leak Mana open. There's the fifth mana. I mean, you don't want to wait and let that Jace do work. Certainly don't. Here they come. Seems like what I'd expect. Stormwatch, my six coming at Jace. Uh, Gideon, Manalik. Wow. Ooh, wow. Cast Jace into the Jace. Spell Pierce mana available. <laughs> Brian says, show me the Spell Pierce. <laughs> okay. There it is. Little Jace down. I mean... I don't know. I just, for some reason, I don't In for two. Mm-hmm. Okay. Josh still has Gideon. Yep. And he passes to Kibler. Kibler has yet again an opportunity to uh, do something. Else. That can be a duress. Duress for the Gideon and Ooh. a Jace. So then there's the sideboard. Is that a maze? I think. That is a mystifying maze. Yeah. So. And he takes the um, Gideon out. And I imagine that he might drop his own Jace then. It seems like a reasonable course of action. One, two, three. Yeah, and then he goes plus two on Jace. Yeah, which does mean that if uh, Josh puts down the Mystifying Maze, I believe I see a Celestial Colonnade there, Josh can kill Jace straight up. Uh, so, did Brian <coughs> take the Jace up? I don't know if I saw Josh draw an extra card. I think he might have just wound it down. Hmm. So he's giving Josh an opportunity to resolve his own Jace here. Well, um, maybe he didn't plus it at all. Maybe he just cast it and said go. Huh. Because then he can't kill the Jace without making Josh activate the... Uh... Okay, no, he did draw, do the draw card. And here comes Jace of his own. Yep. Ouch. Yeah. I'm really interested with uh, you know, Brian's course of action there. Taking the Gideon instead of the Jace? Well, just in general. the uh, you know Playing the Jace then after uh, and not taking it up. Just letting your opponent have that play. Now uh, Frickson Crusader comes down. Right. And uh, Which sadly is bounceable. Yeah. And, uh, Josh has his one real answer to the Frickson Crusader in play right now. Pro-white, pro-red, first strike, in fact. Thank you. Josh well, is back down to five mana. Uh, back up to six. Spins it down to bounce the Crusader. Activates, attacks for six. Okay. Three turn clock, down to two more turns for the kill. And Brian's going to need to spend at least one turn here. Killing a Jace. Okay, the Creeping Tar Pit takes out Jace. Not much that Josh can do about that, but that does mean that 
Again, two attacks, and Brian is uh, is going to be dead unless something happens. Necropede? Ah, Contagion class. Sadly for uh, Brian, there are no poison counters yet on Josh. And now, what's interesting is that, uh, you know, alongside the Planeswalker's Contagion class was also quite a good spell. So now this actually means he's bought himself in a, a full turn by clasping that, uh, yeah. that Mystic. The preordain from Josh here. And Josh just really wants uh, like his power spells at this point. Absolutely. I'm surprised he uh, chose to attack before casting that preordain. Might have uh, wanted more options beforehand. Uh, at this point, he's got Brian on the ropes, and uh, he wants to close. Brian only has two cards left in his hand. Creeping Tar Pit as a potential attacker in play. Another Creeping Tar Pit casts Skiff. No, no, my bad. The, the Crusader that we've seen several yep. times so far. I assume Josh is going to uh, get in here with his Colonnade again. Yep, Colonnade will kill in two swings. Yep. And Brian really needs a card like Tumble Magnet right now. Yeah, a Tumble Magnet, I think, would actually make the game end. Just about. Not necessarily. I mean, Josh could always draw Planeswalkers. So he could play his own Tumble Magnet to turn off the Tumble. Oh, wow, Inky. Hmm. Wow, I didn't even see that Inky there. Yeah, and, uh, and with that, that Inky, the Contagion, Contagion class. class can really wind yeah. that thing down a bit. This guy could be a Hawk. Wow, yeah. that's a good Hawk right now. It is a good Hawk. Brian needs a Contagion Engine. Did you say Contagion Engine? Yeah. <laughs> he had one last time. I don't think he does this time around. Not, not in his board anymore. In with the Crusader. Crusader gets two poisons in on there. Meanwhile, it looks like uh, Josh Sylvester might be one of the first players we've seen with uh, Hawks that aren't marked in some way. Oh, wow. Another clasp. And I mean, Josh is just completely refilled, so he has access to... You know, a lot of hawks. <laughs> but it's interesting here because Brian, you know, can just turn up that class. Yeah. And the class is essentially doing two to his opponent here. Yep. Yeah. Now, Josh. What he's, I think, contemplating is whether he wants to activate his colonnade and use that for, um, it'll be only two damage should uh, he clasp, and then follow it up by casting more hawks, or just cast hawk, hawk, hawk. Yeah. I mean, that's... The one plan does two damage now and puts a clock of two on the table. So that'll actually be a three-turn kill, and the other one is also a three-turn kill. Yeah, it's the same numbers. But there's differences in what stage you're in at each point along the way. Yeah. Here he gets uh, three points in, but spun on at four, cast one squadron hawk. And the other part it's is he does have a mystifying enough. maze in play, and that mystifying maze can hold off that crusader. Yep. Clasp knocks the um, colonnade down to two, kills off the mystic, and knocks one extra poison onto Josh Sylvester. I mean, this class would do so much work in Brian's deck. Uh, the top of Brian's deck, though, really has to be kind. Just really has him on the ropes, putting him at four. Who suggests gets to play two Hawks? Yep. Just five, six. Next turn, assuming that Kibler leaves mana open for a class, mm -hmm. Josh can still get in for three damage. Oh, look at that. Ooh, three damage. Ooh, I think... Does Brian have it? 
No, the mystifying mace. More for that mace, though. I think Brian might have it. Um, one, two. You were looking at the idea that if it wasn't for the maze, he'd be able to attack with the Crusader, not die. Two turns die. in a row. Yeah. I mean, if Brian Kibler has a uh, a land, he can start double clasping. If it's an untapped land. Um. Does he, does he only have six now, or does he's he only, have he's seven? Got, he's got. Um, I thought he had seven. That's only six. You're right. Yeah, but uh, you know, even with seven, he can activate the tar pit and block, and then activate a class, which changes things quite a bit. Brian, Brian sporting a Megan Holland sticker there, mtgmom.com. I'm interested to see what uh, what Brian has for us here. Yeah. Because, I mean, he wouldn't slow roll us. He wouldn't beat. slow roll a, a tumble magnet, I don't think. Into the Royal. Kick wow. Kicker main face. I like that play. Wow. So I, I want to draw the card on my main face. Says go, Pass holding things down a little bit. It does mean, however, by doing that play, that if Josh Silvestri activates the colonnade, that he can knock Kibler down to one by an attack in the air. And then if he's at one, he can follow it up with another squadron hawk, the one that just got bounced, um, which would then put Kibler in a position where he literally needs two out, two cards to get out. However, he just attacks with the one uh, Squadron Hawk. Right now, it looks like they're talking about what the life totals are. <laughs> Taking with the Squadron Hawk, Brian goes down to three. <laughs> yeah, I was confused. I was like, what? I don't know. This game's looking a lot better for you than you think. Apparently. <laughs> I mean, this point looks really bad for Brian. Yep. What's he got? Mana leak for something. Mana leak, uh to try to tap down Josh on the, the second hawk. Third hawk for the... Yeah, now, uh, this may just be bait. That's an hour. You're just fun with it, man. Mm. Oh, man. Uh, so you get a payment? Yeah, gonna... Pays. It's amazing right now. Brian has six mana, but he would just love to have had a couple more, I think. Preordain. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be casting. Uh, I'm not even really sure what he's looking for at this point. Yeah, I agree. Uh, an extra contagion class? Does that get him there? Uh, no, not quite. Still a little short. It does strike me that Josh has kind of been playing around uh, cards like this figure. Yeah. So, I mean, if Josh continues to play around a card like this figure, uh, a class would be able to potentially um, make Sylvester play, him, play around him too much. You know what I mean? But let's see what we get. Interesting There's a seventh uh, land. A tumble, oh, magnet. I'm tumble magnet. Mana leaked. And yeah, Brian picks it up. Brian packs it in. Now uh, we're going on to a game three here. Brian gets to be on the play. Yeah, big time. Big deal. As we've learned in standard, in just about every single matchup, being on the play is absolutely huge. Yep. There's still three spawn on the table and a colony. There are some decks that can operate well on the draw. They can go over the top box. Right. Decks like Rug. So, oh, right. But, uh, now, what happened in this game that was really interesting, like, just thinking about it, Kibler um, used Discard to get rid of 
numerous, numerous, very powerful spells. He got rid of um, a Gideon. He got rid of two Swords of Feast and Famine. And basically what he was beaten down by, for the most part, was just a bunch of dorks. Yeah, and the thing is, like, Kibler didn't have the early Crusader, mm -hmm. which is so important in this matchup. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was actually, actually a four, so. I believe that the Celestial Colonnade got in for four once. Yeah, that was the seven I went, for sure. Yeah, no, seven I went. That's what... Yep. That's where I was coming from. Like, I so, I mean, it basically yeah. just was kind of a little bit of poke here, poke there was, was how that ended up playing out. I'm interested to hear what Brian has to say about not taking up the Jace also. Yeah. I mean, it could just be that Gideon by itself on the board is just too hard to, to kill. You know, that, like, it would just be... Well, I was wondering why he didn't take up the Jace. Right, right here, forever. Just ticking it up instead of Tick, it Ticking up, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Which then forces uh, forces Josh to activate his colonnade to kill the Jace, and then by so doing means that there's another turn where Jace, Mind Sculptor, is not on the board. Yes. Yeah, I mean, the problem with Brian's deck is that it's it's weak to Planeswalkers, and right, it, it's gonna it's gonna take some. Uh, some hard work to figure out how to fix that problem. I mean, I think the answer to that problem is something we've talked about, which is just get an extra Jace Bellerin in, in there and maybe have another one on the board. And then just suck up um, Gideon Jura, you know? I mean, the thing about a card like Gideon Jura, it can be mana leaked and it has, you know, duress as a, as a real issue for it. Now, one of these players will be going out to the top four, which we, we will be covering tomorrow morning. Um, the top four will uh, probably have some claw blade. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Maybe not though. Oh, it'll definitely have claw blade. There's one mirror. All you magic players who are still hanging out. Both Four lands and three good cards. Just gets your deck to like three lengths. So, yeah, that's, that's what we will be closing the hall properly. Looks like Jerry's match finished. I should have seen one there. I'm not three people in now. No, no, no. Should be no longer than 15 minutes or so before we close the hall, guys. I had tumble magnitude, then maybe. So, Jerry has won the first match, two to one. Oh, nice. So, uh, Jerry Thompson into the top four. How do they work? I don't know. Close that question on the end. And uh, Ricky Zao won. Um, I've got a uh, Glenn saying it's still in progress. Ricky Zao won. Okay, so Ricky Zao playing uh, blue white claw, claw blade beat uh, the mono red. Yeah, I believe uh, he had firewalkers on his sideboard. Um, then we have uh, with the killer Celestri match still happening. And then we have uh, the Valka versus Blue White nice. match, and this is a very interesting Valka. <laughs> All right, and uh, we're going up to game three. Looks like a mull for Josh Silvestri. No. Oh. Wow, Ooh, double mull. He's mall. going down to five. Not that I do anything with taking cards out of here. <laughs> oh, and I think Brian's oh. talking about how mulliganing with that deck isn't really that big of a deal. <laughs> I can just, uh, you know, kind of picture him. Oh, I mean, come on, all you need to do is draw one of eight cards and you're yeah. fine. No big it's deal. True. You just get a refund. <laughs> yeah. You can just shuffle some away with your Jace, get him again. Yeah, that was a, uh, a fast shuffle from Josh. Okay, let's see what happens with five cards. Josh goes down to five, and uh, so he has a Stoneforge Mystic. It's probably good enough. So long as it resolves. <laughs> Creeping Tar Pit, is that? And on the other side, we've got a Preordain. Ooh, and I think Josh might be digging for a second land. Yep. And Brian Kibler now has access to the potential for discard of all kinds. 
Ooh, preordain. Which means he's shutting down the option for Mana Leak. At least for this turn, I mean. Oh, yeah. And I mean, that that could give Josh an opening to, you know, it resolve Stoneforge. And Forge he says go. Like so there is no Inquisition coming to uh, do any work there. And Josh does not have the apparent comes into play untapped white. Yeah, I mean, that Stoneforge Mystic would have been really huge there. And here <laughs> is a Celestial Colonnade. Now, I mean, Josh is still in this game. Like, he, he's just, he's going to play a uh, Stoneforge Mystic next turn. A small oh, correction. A, um, rookie Zoe won 2-0, to zero, not 2-1 to one on the previous other match that we didn't watch. Okay. Crusader. The first cut is the deepest. I prefer you. V Tumble Magnet. So good. good times. Duress. Duress has options for Mana Leak. Is that double Mana Leak? Yep. Preordain. And the Preordain. interesting. He almost wished he didn't play it so that he could have not the sword that Stoneforge got. Surprised Brian decided to uh, knock it in with the uh, ink. He may have another play, though. Right. If he plays another Crusader, it's really bad for his opponent. And there goes the Preordain. Yeah, it's, he's probably going to like... Uh, oh, Jace yeah. B. That's... Ouch. That chase is going to continue unmolested for several turns at least. Yep. He's going to uh, at least counsel off it. Perhaps more. It looks like it comes into play untapped land. Or sorry, tapped land is in Josh's hand. At least that's what his body language said to me. <laughs> Let's yeah. see if I'm right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. More counting. Yeah, he's, uh, Try again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, I mean, it's just really bad for him. <laughs> but to five is always rough. It's really rough to do that, like, in game three of a rubber match. Yeah. You know, you're in top eight. He passes. Josh somebody who, you know, a very good player, somebody who's pretty visible in the community. And, uh, you know, it's awesome to see him go so deep in this tournament. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that he hadn't long to five this game. Of course, he's by no means out of the game. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And we have Ink Mouth Nexus activating. Declare the attack. Neither of them gets tapped by the Tumble Magnet. Poison to three. Yep. Josh draws a card. Does that look like another Mana Leak? I think he just drew. Yeah, those are not the cards he wants to be drawing Yeah, right triple now. Mana Leak right now is not exciting. If that is indeed what he drew. Activate Inky. Oh. Tap. Down to four. Is it four poison? Yeah. Creeping Tarpa hits the table for Brian Kibler. Now, poisoning people out. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've ever done it in a uh, high level play, but it's really fun. You know, I have to say, <laughs> I have only done it in the, um, what's it called, uh, sealed deck format and the draft format. I mean, it's especially exciting when you uh, get to do it in uh, constructed. <laughs> we you have. Know, uh, who, I don't understand. Uh, what do you mean, some, doing that in constructed? Or not constructed? Poisoning in, people. In, in, in time spiral draft. How does that work? Ooh, in time spiral draft? <laughs> oh, in time spiral constructed? Uh, there's the Virulent Sliver deck. <laughs> oh. Rashad is smiling and so happy on the sidelines. Yeah, I remember Frank Carson wrote an excellent article about that. I now, mean, uh, on the we table, got Stone Feast and Famine. Sword. We have. Uh, it feels too little, too late to me, honestly. Just looking at this board state. And the magnet might just use the last counter this turn. Here's a fifth mana. Jace is spin, 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 and just. What's that fifth mana gonna do? Kibler is in turn counting, and we've got activate Inky. Attack, you want to do something? Yeah. I will use the last of my counters to tap your right. Crusader. 
Five no, poison. Five poison. <laughs> One short of it. Can I call you back in, like, the Kibler's like magic number? Minutes. Yes. <laughs> it won't take that long. <laughs> Now, uh, I mean, uh, it's possible for Josh to win this game. Absolutely, absolutely. It's just really rough. And a player like Brian Kibler, he's really good. Yeah. And he's he's not going to play any of these mana leaks. And you know, when Josh taps out, when Josh you know finally decides that he has to tap out, Brian's just going to punish him. Yep. And leave these mana leaks stranded in his hand. Josh attacks the Jace to finish it off. Land, Jace uh, the Mind Sculptor, tapping and, uh, pretty far down, deprive the goo. And, uh, wow, yeah. there we go. Yeah, and wow. Brian Kibler goes into the top four of the Star City Games Standard Open here in L.A. I, I mean, I think it's fair to say that right now, two of our top four were probably, if you walked into the room at the beginning of the day, people...